It's a privilege for me to be here with you this morning to share from you from Nehemiah chapter 4. So over the last few times that I've been here, um, we've been going through the book of Nehemiah. We're into chapter 4 this morning. We have nine more chapters to go until um, we get to the end. So I'm looking forward to working our way through the book together. How many of you have uh, faced discouragement in your life? Okay, I'm sure everyone will put their hand up. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Pam. So this morning we're going to look at, from Nehemiah chapter 4, how to deal with discouragement when it comes your way, and it will. We all will face discouragement at some stage or other um, in, in our lives. Do you know who this person is? Anybody? Pam, you're not allowed to say who it is because you know. <laughs> Any guesses who this might be? Okay, he's a, he's a rather good-looking young guy. Um, uh, you all know him, by the way. You all know him very well. Is it you? No, it's not me. <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> okay, I'll put you out of your misery. His name is Edward A. Murphy Jr. And he was born in 1918. He died in 1990. And he was an, an American aerospace engineer who worked on safety critical um, systems for the US Air Force. And specifically, he conducted experiments to test human acceleration tolerances. Um, so basically what he did was, you know, to put fighter pilots through their paces to test the effect of G-forces on the human body. Okay. Unfortunately, on one of those tests, he installed 16 motion sensors the wrong way. Leading to the now famous quotation, if anything can go wrong, it will. Okay, so you know who we're talking about here. Murphy's Law. Okay. So that's where Murphy's Law began with this young man, or at that stage he was a young man, Edward, Edward A. Murphy Jr. If anything can go wrong, it will. And I guess the upshot to that is also true. If anything can't go wrong, it will anyway. <laughs> There are some other laws as well that have been blamed on poor Mr. Murphy. One of them is, left to themselves, things tend to go from bad to worse. That's true, isn't it? If you leave something to itself, it'll go from bad to worse. An item will be damaged in direct proportion to its value. I once borrowed somebody's boat and uh, hit a rock with the propeller, and it was a very expensive mistake. Um, so an item will be damaged in direct proportion to its value. You will never find a lost article until you replace it. <laughs> Everything goes wrong all at once. And that seems to happen when you just really don't need those things to go wrong, and they just go wrong, and everything else goes wrong as well. Another one that, if everything seems to be going well, you've obviously overlooked something. <laughs> okay. So as we come to Nehemiah chapter 4, we see that Mr. Murphy, although he wasn't born at the time, shows up in Jerusalem <clears throat> and has an effect on the construction project that was taking place at that time. So in chapter 1, we saw that Nehemiah began to pray. As he heard about the situation back in Jerusalem, remember Nehemiah was in captivity. He had never been back to Jerusalem. He was born in captivity. And he heard a report about how bad things were in Jerusalem. And so he begins to pray because he's really moved by the report he hears of the conditions in Jerusalem. So in chapter 1, he begins this process of prayer. <clears throat> in chapter 2, we see how God moves Nehemiah. Remember, he had a rather cushy, cushy job as cupbearer to the king. And 
Nehemiah very boldly approaches the king and says, you know, I need three, three years leave. Uh, I need to go back to Jerusalem and sort out the situation there. And so he, um, God, through a, a series of events, moves Nehemiah from, Jerusalem, from Persia <clears throat> back to the desolation of Jerusalem. And then last time we met, we saw as they began to build the walls <clears throat> uh, that in God's kingdom work, no one can do everything, but everyone can do something. We saw that in chapter 3 of, of Nehemiah. And because of that, because the people rallied, because everyone began to get involved, and we saw how different people worked on different sections of the wall. Some of them worked in multiple locations. Because of that, the construction project was really zipping along. Things were going really, really well. But when we come to chapter 4, things start to get complicated <clears throat> for Nehemiah. As I said, Mr. Murphy shows up and reminds Nehemiah that when everything seems to be going well, you've obviously overlooked something. And as we are all, uh, uh, as we're all aware, you know, we've all come out of uh, COVID. Uh, on Friday night, I think it was, the Stellenbosch City Orchestra was playing at Lawrenceford Estate in Somerset West. I don't know, have any of you been to that? The orchestra, they, they go into the cellar and you sit underneath all of these big stainless steel wine vats and the orchestra's there. It's a really beautiful location and the acoustics are amazing. But I was sitting there with all these people and it just struck me that here we are all sitting and even here this morning with no masks. Do, do any of you feel that sense of, uh, you know, maybe it's, a, it's almost like a nakedness where you go into, into the store and you don't have a mask. Uh, we, we, we got so used to, to living like that. And so we've come out of the pandemic of COVID and things seem to be getting back to normal. However, there is another pandemic that we are facing. <clears throat> A pandemic that's probably just as serious as the COVID pandemic, maybe even more so. And that is the pandemic of discouragement. I'm hearing of more and more people, especially younger people, who are really struggling with their mental health. Many people are struggling with discouragement and depression. And there are, are at least three things that make discouragement such an insidious problem. The first one is that it is universal. None of us, as you all indicated this morning, none of us are immune to discouragement. <clears throat> Everyone you have ever known has been discouraged at some time or the other in their life. You know, COVID, we could go and get the vaccine and hopefully that would protect us from getting the, 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 the virus. But there is no vaccine against discouragement. There is nothing that will prevent you or stop you from becoming discouraged. So it's universal. We all face it. We'll all, we'll all be there at some stage or the other in our lives. The second thing is that it's recurring. You know, if you've had COVID, supposedly you have enough um, antibodies in your system that you shouldn't get it again, or if you do, it, wouldn't, it won't be as, as, as serious as the time before. But being discouraged once doesn't give you immunity to being discouraged again. <clears throat> You'll be discouraged many different times in your life. You can be discouraged over and over again. In fact, you can even be discouraged by the fact that you are discouraged. <clears throat> the third thing, sorry, the third thing there is that it's highly contagious. Have you ever noticed that? Discouragement spreads even just by casual contact, just like COVID. Others can be discouraged or become discouraged because you are discouraged and vice versa. So this morning, as we think about those things, let's focus on both the causes and the cures for discouragement that we will find here 
in Nehemiah chapter 4. <clears throat> there are two types of discouragement. There is, first of all, discouragement that comes from the outside. Let's call it external discouragement. And then there is discouragement that tax, attacks us from within. The things we think in our, our, our minds. And we'll call that internal discouragement. So let's look, first of all, at the external causes of discouragement. <clears throat> So if you've been following along with us through our journey in Nehemiah, you'll see that when they began the, the construction project of rebuilding these walls, <clears throat> excuse me, that had been broken down for the last hundred years, initially they were very excited. Everyone began enthusiastically. <clears throat> they all got together and they began to work flat out. Remember that it took them 52 days to complete this project. Uh, you know, that must have been a record for their time to rebuild these walls in just 52 days. And so that could only have happened because there was this initial enthusiasm, this initial excitement. They began the work with tremendous anticipation and tremendous joy. And it says in verse 6 of chapter 4 that the people worked with all their heart. They gave it everything that they had. They, they just really poured their lives into getting these walls rebuilt. Things were going well. The people were excited. The wall was going up. They could actually see the progress that they had, that they had made. But then something changed. Something happened to reverse all of that. Getting the work started was a major achievement. You know, we must never underestimate how Nehemiah came in and he, he rallied the people. He, he brought a plan and they began to work that plan. And so, you know, starting the project was a tremendous achievement. But keeping the workers working proved to be a much tougher assignment for Nehemiah. And here's why. Because where God is at work, the enemy is at work also. We must always remember that. Where God is at work, whether it's in our own lives, whether it's in our community, whether it's in our church, where God is working, the enemy is also at work. And the rebuilding of the walls in Jerusalem was no exception. When people take God's kingdom work seriously, Satan will stir up agitators. He will stir up trouble causes to block the work of God. And these enemies that we see here in Nehemiah chapter 4 used two kinds of external discouragement. The first one was ridicule. <clears throat> we see this in verses 1 and 2. So there it says, when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the walls, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore the wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life? from those heaps of rubble, burnt as they are. And so you, you, you see the tactic of Sanballat, the enemy to what God was doing there. He begins to ridicule them. And in fact, this is the third time in the book that we come across Sanballat. And he, in fact, was Nehemiah's stiffest opposition. He was the one with the loudest voice. He was the one who opposed them at every step of the way. And every time we read about Sanballat, he is standing against the work of God, rejecting and ridiculing everything that Nehemiah is trying to accomplish. Someone once said that ridicule is the language of the devil. 
And we know that the enemy oftentimes insults the servants of God. If you think back to some examples in the Bible, we, we read in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 41 to 47, that Goliath ridiculed David. When this young shepherd boy comes to meet him with only a sling in his hand. We see that when Jesus um, was before Pontius Pilate during his trial, that the soldiers mocked him and ridiculed him. That while he hung up on the cross in Luke chapter 22 and Luke chapter 23, that the crowd taunted him and mocked him and ridiculed him. That is the language of the devil. And we know that Sanballat and his cronies had begun to ridicule the workers even before they started the work. If you go back to chapter 2, verse 19, it says there that they mocked and ridiculed us. And here in chapter 4, we find him standing before the army of Samaria, and he now is intensifying the power of that ridicule. The mocking and the ridicule becomes stronger and it becomes louder. I want you to first notice that he ridicules the workers themselves. That's where he begins. He begins by ridiculing the workers. He calls them feeble. The word feeble means withered and miserable. Then he moves on and he begins to ridicule the work that they were doing by asking them all of these taunting questions. Firstly, will they restore the wall? And that must have made the Samaritan army burst out in laughter as they saw the wall all broken down and the rubble lying everywhere and the efforts of these people to try and rebuild it. Will they restore it? Can they even do this? How could a remnant of feeble Jews hope to build a wall strong enough to protect them from the Samaritan army? The next thing he says to them, will they offer sacrifices? What is he saying to them? Well, he's saying, you know, it's going to take more than a prayer and worship to rebuild this city. He's saying to them, you know, your God is not strong enough. Your God is not able to achieve and accomplish this. Then he says to them, will they finish in a day? Planting the seeds in their minds, you know, that you have no idea how difficult this task is. You're just going to give up. You're going to stop building this wall. And then he says, can they bring these stones back to life? Remember, the wall had been broken down for a hundred years. That rubble had been lying in piles for a hundred years. The weeds were probably growing up through the broken bricks and stones and mortar. Can they bring these stones back to life? These Material that the materials that they're using are so old and so damaged that there is no possibility that they can become a strong wall again. And then in verse 3, we see another of the enemies, another of the opponents, Tobiah. It's now his turn to ridicule the workers when he makes this joke. He says to them, What are they building? Even if a fox climbed up on it, he would break down their wall of stones. Archaeological excavations on these walls have revealed that they were nine feet thick. They would need more than a small fox to break them down. Friends, whenever you attempt to get involved in the work of God, you will always face ridicule. Expect it, but don't stop working. He will ridicule you, and he will ridicule your work. But remember, our God is greater. The second source or cause of their external discouragement was repression. 
And we read that in verses 7 and 8. <clears throat> but when Sanballat, Tobiah the Arab, and the Ammonites and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted to come and fight against Jerusalem and to stir up trouble against it. <laughs> you know, initially they were just kind of bothered by the Jews that they were going to try and repair these walls. But now, now that they see that things are actually happening, that the walls are rising up from the, the ground, they now become very angry. And so they come together and they plot against the Jews. And they start making these boasts that they're going to come and fight Jerusalem, that they're going to come and stir up trouble uh, against it. The reference in verse 7, when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod, that reference there is a reference to the four points of the compass. And we know as you read the book and as you do a bit of research, that Sanballat and the Samaritans were on the north of the city. Ashdod was on the west. Tobiah and the Ammonites <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> were on the east of the city. And the Arabs, Geshem and the Arabs, were to the south. Basically what they're saying is that the city was surrounded by the enemies. And the people who were working on the walls were living in constant fear of being ambushed. They were surrounded by their enemies and you can imagine the fear that came upon them. So those are the external sources of discouragement that we see. But then there are some internal ones. We all know that you know the longer you face pressures from without, if you face them long enough, eventually those are going to become pressures from within. Because what happens is we start to hear those voices. We start to believe the things that we hear. And we internalize them and we, you know, it, be, it leads to problems from within. We, we start doubting. We start doubting. <clears throat> Oppor opposition outside the ranks can lead to depression on the inside. So it wasn't even though the voices from outside were, were consistent and were becoming louder and louder, it wasn't the voice of the enemy that was the most pervasive or the loudest. We see that it was the voice of God's own people. And just like today, it's very easy for us to internalize those words and, and get to the point where we just feel like giving up. I want you to notice the first part of verse 10. Meanwhile, the people of Judah said. They began to talk amongst themselves. You know, we're surrounded by our enemies. And they began to think about all the negative things that that meant. You know, we're not going to be able to last long. These guys are going to come and attack us. They've told us that they're going to attack us. They've told us that they're going to come and stir up trouble. And I want you to notice who it was. Discouragement started first within the royal tribe of Judah. These people had David's blood in their veins. And you would think that they would have more faith and courage than the rest of the people. They were looked upon as the leaders. They were looked upon as the pace setters. But it was the tribe of Judah who began to become discouraged first. And if the tribe of Judah was discouraged, then the other tribes would be more inclined to give up working on the wall. <clears throat> so the first cause of internal discouragement was fatigue. Verse 10, the rest of it says, Meanwhile, the people of Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. 
Simply put, the workers were exhausted. Have you ever been in that place where you have felt totally and utterly exhausted? Where you just can't put one foot in front of another? That's how they felt. They were working flat out, and they had been working flat out for days and weeks, and now they needed some rest. That phrase they're giving out carries with it the idea of staggering and stumbling and tottering about. They were so tired that they staggered when they walked. It was difficult for them to lift one foot up and put it in front of the other. They were exhausted. And we all know that when we are physically drained, that it is very easy for us to become discouraged, even at the slightest problem. When you are tired, the smallest thing can appear to be mountainous. My wife and I have a policy. We don't discuss finances after 7 o'clock at night. <laughs> When you're feeling tired, don't talk about finances. <laughs> talk about it in the morning. You know, if you're feeling tired, don't, don't make big decisions in your life. You know, if you're exhausted, rather wait. Just say, okay, I'm going to spend time just regaining my strength, spend time sleeping, spend time praying, and then I will make a decision. Never make a big decision when you're feeling exhausted, when you're feeling physically drained. It's also interesting to notice when the workers became fatigued and discouraged. Verse 6 tells us that the wall, the wall was built to half its height. They had got up to halfway and then they felt like throwing in the towel. Have you ever been in that place when you're doing a project? When I was growing up, I had many projects on the go, and they were half finished. This one lying over there, that one lying over there. I never seemed to be able to get to finish something. And the same was true for them. They had built the walls up to halfway, and now they were discouraged. Now they were fatigued. And many times when we start a new project, the first, first half goes quickly because we're excited we want to accomplish something. We want, we're looking ahead to the goal of finishing that project. But then the newness begins to wear off. And the work becomes routine. The work becomes boring. And then it's easy for us to become fatigued. And when we're tired, it's easy for us to become discouraged and begin to think that we will never finish the job. Notice what they said at the end of verse 10, there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. They were ready to throw in the town. And these are the same people who in verse 6, we read there that they worked with all their heart. Now they're saying, it's just too much. There's too much rubble. We can't finish the wall. And I want to say to you this morning, if you are feeling fatigued today, if you are facing burnout, watch out. Tiredness can lead to discouragement. Can you remember what God did when Elijah was tired? He sent an angel to give him some bread and something to drink, and then he told him to go back to sleep. We can't burn the candle at both ends on a long-term basis. And sometimes the most spiritual thing that we can do is to go to bed and sleep. The second thing that can happen is that you can get frustrated. Verse 10 continues by saying that there is so much rubble that they cannot rebuild the wall. They had become discouraged because they were frustrated with the situation. And I'm sure that encountering these old broken rocks 
and dirt and dried out mortar and other debris that was underfoot on a daily basis had begun to do something with their minds. All of a sudden, you know, there was junk everywhere and they were becoming frustrated with that. My wife always tells me, she says, I marvel at your ability to wash dishes. <laughs> You know, after we've had someone for dinner and you know what it's like, the kitchen, there's plates and things everywhere. She, she says, I have this ability of before I start washing everything, I'll go and collect all the plates and stack them neatly, put all the, the cups and the glasses in together. And so it makes the whole process of washing the dishes that much easier. I like to make order out of chaos. These guys, in building the wall, you know, they had become discouraged because this chaos was with them every day. Every day they had to step over the rubble. Every day they had to deal with all of this, this brokenness around them. And now they're saying, it's enough. We can't do it anymore. They lost sight of their goal. And we too can lose sight of our goal when we have too much garbage in our lives. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says that we must get rid of anything that causes us to become frustrated in our pursuit of godliness. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 12 1 says, <clears throat> Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with endurance the race marked out before us. And the picture there is of uh, of like vines or, or, or weeds that wrap themselves around your feet as you're trying to walk. The writer of Hebrews is telling us to throw all of those entanglements off. Get rid of all of the chaos and the, the clutter in your lives and focus on following God. Focus on completing and running the race marked out before you with endurance. Another cause of discouragement is fear. The enemies of God had struck fear into the hearts of God's people. And now they, they wanted to give up. Remember what they said in verse 10. We cannot rebuild the wall. Did you notice in verse 12? Who gets afraid the quickest? Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Do you notice that? Those most affected by fear lived near the pessimistic people. And if you want to limit the depressing thoughts that bring fear into your life, then it's best not to hang out with negative people. <laughs> There's a saying, I don't know if you've heard it. If you're going to soar with the eagles, you can't run around with the turkeys. <laughs> don't surround yourself with negative people. Because when you do that, you yourself will become negative. Your outlook will become negative. Fear can put us in a frame of mind where we not only become discouraged, but we also become deceived. I don't want to spoil the ending, but the enemies never do attack Jerusalem. That threatened attack never happens. But in their minds, they were filled with fear. So, how can we deal with discouragement? Now that we know some of the causes of discouragement, ridicule and repression that lead to fatigue and frustration and fear, what can we do about it? Well, there's some good news. Discouragement is a curable disease. You don't have to live with chronic discouragement anymore. Let's look at three cures for discouragement. The first one is request God's help. That sounds simple, but it's probably the last thing we do. In the jungles of Africa, a, a man was being pursued by a roaring lion, a lion that was hungry. 
feeling the beast's hot breath on his neck and knowing that his time was short, he broke out into prayer as he ran like crazy. Oh Lord, please make this lion a Christian. Please make him a Christian. Within seconds, the frightened man noticed that the lion had stopped chasing him. When he looked behind him, he found the lion kneeling and moving his lips in obvious prayer. <laughs> Greatly relieved at this turn of events, he got close enough to the lion to hear him pray and bless, O oh Lord, this food which I am about to receive. <laughs> Nehemiah requested God's help in chapter 1 for Jerusalem. We saw in chapter 2 how Nehemiah prayed that popcorn prayer. You remember he was in the presence of the king and the, the king said to him, you know, why, why are you so sad? Why is your face downcast? And Nehemiah offered up this prayer before he launched into his request for three months, three years leave. And now in chapter 4 we see he prays two different times. And again, and again, and again, we see Nehemiah praying before proceeding. That was his, his motto, pray before proceed. <clears throat> In verses 4 and 5, we read this, Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in, in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. That's quite a prayer, isn't it? You know, he wasn't praying for his enemies to become believers, but instead he prays and he asks God to judge them. His prayer is not nice, but it was understandable and it was honest. He knew that the enemies were really fighting against God. And so he asks God to deal with them. He didn't go and give lectures to the workers. He didn't go and organize raiding parties to go and attack the enemy. He didn't create a propaganda campaign in order to counteract these verbal attacks of the enemies. Instead, he asks God to deal with the problem. And here's the principle that we can learn from Nehemiah. When people talk against you, don't talk back, talk to God. Verse 9 tells us that he first prayed to God and then he posted a guard on the wall. And so when their enemies started talking, Nehemiah continues to pray and the people continue to work. The second cure is to reorganize your priorities. In verse 13, it says, Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest point of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords and spears and bows. Now, we know that Nehemiah had already organized the people in chapter 3, and they had finished half of their task. They had built the, wall, the walls up to halfway. But now there was a new situation. There was a new problem. And this required a change in organization. This required a change in the plans. If the enemies were going to attack, it would be most likely at the weakest points in the wall. And so Nehemiah posts guards at all of the vulnerable spots around the wall. And this served two purposes. Obviously, it prevented the enemy from attacking them, but also it encouraged the people because it dealt with their fear. They were fearful of the people attacking, but Nehemiah allayed that fear by posting these people to, to guard the walls. <clears throat> So when you are discouraged, one of the things that you can do is to reorganize your priorities. You can adopt a change in approach instead of become, becoming discouraged that you quit. So let's think about that practically. Do you have a problem in your marriage? If so, 
Don't bail on your spouse. Change your approach. Adopt a new attitude. Get some help. Do you have a problem with your job situation? Don't give up. Change your priorities. Do you have a problem with your walk with God? Don't stop following Jesus. Instead, reorganize your schedule so that you can meet with Him on a regular basis. Don't become overwhelmed or overcome by your discouragement. Do something about it. And in verse 16, we see that the workers reorganized again by dividing their responsibilities. Half of them worked while half of them kept guard. Those who worked, we're told, used one hand for pushing the wheelbarrow and with the other hand they carried a weapon. And they worked together as a team to overcome that discouragement. And then lastly, if you want to overcome or defeat discouragement, remember who God is. After looking everything over, after sensing their discouragement within the team, Nehemiah calls the troops together and he says to them in verse 14, it should be verse 14, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Nehemiah knew, even in the face of opposition, that the su success of the wall depended wholly on God. It was God who inspired it at the beginning. Verse 10 was true. The people could not build the wall on their own. They needed to remember that God is the one who said he would rebuild it. God is the one who, who promised to be with them. I don't know about you, but it's very easy for me to forget God when things get tough. Sometimes things get so tough that the last thing you want to do is to pray. Yeah. Where you don't even have the words. Where maybe you're facing something and it may be discouragement. It may be grief, it may be anything you can think of, where you just find it hard to speak to God. You find it difficult to get into His Word. And so I need to be reminded, I, I need to be reminded that God is always there for me. I need to remember that. How do you remember the Lord? How do you remember that He is great and awesome? God is more than able to deal with your discouragement. So when you're feeling down, when you're feeling discouraged, turn your attention to Him. He is the one who is able to do something about it. And here's how I remember God. I remember that God has been faithful to me in the past. I begin by looking back and looking back on the times in my life where God has been faithful to me. I remember how God is faithful to me today. And I also know that God has promised that to be faithful to me in the future. Remember the Lord. Remember His promises. Remember His goodness. Remember His power. Our God is a great and awesome God. Remember Him. The people complained about all the rubble in verse 10. But wasn't the rubble there in the beginning? Of course it was. It had been there for a hundred years. The difference now was that when they started the project, they were focused on God and His character. Now they had become a people of rubble gazers. Friend, if you focus on the junk in your life, if you focus on the junk in the lives of others, you will become discouraged. And I want to encourage you this morning to determine to be God gazers instead of rubble gazers. 
I've never been to San Francisco, but the Golden Gate Bridge was completed in 1937. At the time, it was the longest suspension bridge in the world. During the first phase of the project in building it, 23 men fell to their deaths in the icy water of the San Francisco Bay. Murphy's laws were in evidence. Things were going from bad to worse because there were very few safety devices. And so when it was halfway completed, they decided to take another look and to make some changes. Do you know what they did? They organized and built the biggest and largest net ever made. And they attached it underneath the bridge, under the area where the men were working. Was it worth the cost and the time that it took to do this? Ask the 10 men who fell into it without being injured. Not only did it save 10 lives, but I'm told that the work was completed in three-fourths of the time because the workers no longer lived in fear of falling. Friends, I want to remind you this morning that God's safety net, God's net of security undergirds your life. Right now. No matter where you live, no matter what you've done in your past, no matter how discouraged you've been, God stretches out his, uh, his, his everlasting arms underneath you. And as a result, you can live and you can work and you can relate with others freely and without fear, knowing that you are protected, that you are safe, that you are secure in his loving arms. Discouragement can be defeated as we request God's help, as we reorganize our priorities, and as we remember who He is. Don't leave here this morning without just taking a moment to remember who God is. That He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or imagine or think. And so I want to encourage you, don't internalize that discouragement, but ask God to help you. His loving arms are underneath, ready to catch you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for what we have learned from Nehemiah this morning. Lord, thank you that when we are discouraged, when we are feeling down and depressed, Lord, that you know you know our thoughts, you know our feelings, you know our struggles, even before we feel them. And we are reminded this morning of your loving arms, your everlasting arms beneath us. We thank you for that, Lord. May it encourage us, may it bring us comfort, may it give us peace this morning. And Father, we, we just praise you for your goodness to us. Thank you for this chapter. Thank you for what we can learn from Nehemiah and the situation they faced. Lord, may we take some of these things and apply them to our own lives today by the power and the guidance of your Holy Spirit. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.